Hi everyone, I'm back. Okay, needed a little break after that, huh? That was a little bit. That was a little bit much. Oops, what did I do? I want this. All right. So that was the hardest one, metabolic acidosis. So if it's confusing, just you might want to listen to it again. You might want to just kind of look at your book, look under the metabolic acidosis, read that part of the book. Sometimes reading something versus listening to a lecture, it reads like a story, it might be a little bit easier to understand. But metabolic acidosis is definitely going to be the hardest one out of these. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is a metabolic alkalosis, serum pH greater than 7.45. That should make sense to you now. Okay, this isn't a memorizing thing. Bicarb levels, remember the bicarb levels that we're talking about normal are 22 to 26. So when they get greater than 26, then we look at that and we just say, this person's in a metabolic alkalosis. Okay, occurs when the bicarb is increased either due to, again, kind of the flip of what we just said. Either they're losing acid, acids dumping out of their body some way, or the body is accumulating base. Two main kind of reasons. A loss of acid, probably one of the most common reasons we see patients in a metabolic acidosis is, whoops, right here, vomiting. Think about all that hydrochloric acid in their, in their gut. They're losing acid. All, all the hydrochloric acid just coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out of their mouth, okay? Gastric suctioning, we put an NG tube in patients, right? Goes down into their belly, hook it up to suction, suck it out, suck it out, suck it out. All their acid gets sucked out. Acid being depleted from their body, they go into a metabolic alkalosis. Diuretics are certainly something that can cause a metabolic alkalosis. And here's the reason. Remember with diuretics, we're losing fluid and electrolytes. As somebody's potassium drops, as potassium drops, it causes a patient to become alkalotic. So potassium levels in, in the blood, um, as they drop, it causes them to be alkalotic. So let me just kind of explain something. So keep in mind something very important that we've learned about potassium. It's important to, for you to know that potassium is an intracellular electrolyte. It lives in the cell. If we drew a potassium from the inside of a cell, it'd be about 140 milliequivalents. We draw potassium out of the blood, it's about four milliequivalents, okay? So it wants to live in the cell. When somebody is, um, alkalotic, this environment right here, somebody has alkalosis for whatever reason, potassiums want to leave the blood and run into the, run into the cell. So sometimes I remember it is hypokalemia, ah, low K, okay? In an alkalotic environment, we're going to see hypokalemia. We see that in acute care settings. We have somebody hooked up to this section right here. They're alkalotic. They have a metabolic alkalosis. Their potassium is 3.3. We give them potassium. It's 3.3. We give them another rider of potassium. It's 3.3. It never can get better because when somebody is in an alkalotic state, potassium decreases. So as potassium decreases, that can also cause somebody to go into an alkalotic state. Accumulation of base, administration of bicarb. Maybe in an acute care setting, we're giving them bicarb. Maybe somebody's just, just taking too much bicarbonate sodium or something, taking some kind of medication or product and just dumping bicarb in their body. But this generally is our reason right here for a metabolic alkalosis. So these aren't really anything I want you to take just to get, get, get caught up in the minutia and memorize every one of these. But um, just some things that, you know, we kind of talked about is a metabolic alkalosis. Um, remember this right here. Um, GI suctioning, diuretics, excess. Okay, we talked about that. Hypokalemia. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's really the main thing. These are just kind of some vague symptoms that we can see when somebody has any type of fluid and electrolyte imbalances.
That's metabolic. Metabolic to me is harder than respiratory. Okay, so the next two we're going to talk about are respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So keep in mind when we have a respiratory problem, we're talking about CO2. We're talking about a metabolic problem here. We're talking about the bicarbs. That's important to keep in mind. So respiratory acidosis is caused by a decrease in the rate of breathing, or we call it alveolar hypoventilation. Somebody is hypoventilating. They're not breathing. They're not exhaling. CO2 is retained. We have an excess CO2. We call that hypercapnia, high CO2, hypercapnia. Maybe acute. It may be chronic. Okay. Acute respiratory acidosis, again, the most common thing you think about, which makes total sense, we over sedate somebody, whether it's intentional or unintentional, somebody over sedates themselves, or we do, we over sedate somebody, we decrease their respiratory rate, okay, shallow respiratory rate, over sedation is a very common cause of an acute respiratory acidosis. Chronic respiratory acidosis, classic would be a COPD, okay, COPD patients are CO2 retainers. You know that, you learn that, your nurses, you, you know that. They, they retain CO2, they have an obstructive airway disease. So when they exhale, their CO2 gets caught up in their, in their alveolar and their CO2 retainers, barrel, chest, it gets all stuck in there. But guess what? The kidneys have time. They're like, this person's got you know, um, high CO2s. The kidneys compensate, the kidneys compensate, and the kidneys compensate. So they're just in a chronic respiratory acidosis state. They chronically have high CO2s, but often their pHs are between 7.35 and 7.45 because the kidneys have compensated. Over sedation, the most common cause, head injuries, the respiratory centers are um, affected, and there's multiple other reasons as far as why somebody would have hypoventilation, hypoxia. Sometimes somebody has other metabolic problems going on and they just they get too tired, they can't breathe hypoventilation. Um, so these are just some symptoms right here. Again, keep in mind, basically what I want you to keep in mind is a low respiratory rate, a decreased respiratory rate. Hypoventilation causes respiratory acidosis. That's the main thing to think about. Anesthesia, overdose, those are, those are common things that we see. COPD could be something or, or is definitely something that puts that patients are chronic respiratory acidosis who are CO to PD patients. Respiratory alkalosis. Now, opposite respiratory alkalosis, alveolar hyperventilation. <sighs> Something's causing this person to hyperventilate. Hence, the CO2 is leaving the body, leaving the body. It's decreasing in the blood. It's coming out. It's coming out. We call that hypocapnia, low CO2, stimulated by an increased breathing. What are things that can cause respiratory alkalosis? Well, you've probably all seen this, somebody going into an anxiety or a panic attack. I just, I, just, I am so scared. And they're hyperventilating, hyperventilating. And sometimes somebody comes in the ear like that. They give them a brown bag. They start breathing in the brown bag. That CO2 that they're blowing off, they're breathing back in, and it kind of can help them a little bit. Fever, anemia, pain, fever, pain or two things. Mechanical ventilation, sometimes we can overventilate somebody with a ventilator and it can certainly put them into a respiratory alkalosis. But again, respiratory alkalosis is caused by hyperventilation. It's a breathing problem. It's not a respiratory, excuse me, it's not a metabolic problem, okay? So respiratory hyperventilation right here, hyperventilation, um, Numbness, tingling of an extremities. What happens here? It might have ha actually happened to you, or you may see people who are hyperventilating, and they have these like reflexes and muscle cramping. Their fingers get really tetany, and 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 they've got cramps, and their hands get get all turned in, and and they get some numbness and tingling. And basically, what happens as the blood becomes alkalotic, um, in an alkalotic blood, as the pH starts to increase in the blood, the calcium it doesn't like that alkalotic environment and it attaches itself to albumin. Now the serum calcium goes down when somebody's in a respiratory alkalosis. Do it. Hyperventilate for two minutes and see what happens to your fingers, how numb and tingly they get. And get bad enough, they will have tetany and you'll have hyperreflexes and muscle cramping in your hand. Because now the calcium has gone down because in this alkalotic environment, the calcium wants to go connect itself to albumin. Calciums go down. We have these hypocalcemic 
symptoms. It only, it only takes about two minutes for that to happen. And if you do any kind of work in the ER, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. So um, that's kind of something with, with, with respiratory alkalosis, but hyperventilation, anxiety. And this is interesting, pulmonary embolism. Okay, pulmonary embolism would cause a respiratory alkalosis. Why does that make sense? Well, anything, anything that causes somebody to be hypoxic, okay, their, their, their oxygen levels are going down because they have a pulmonary embolism or even something like pneumonia, you can see that side like a perfect certification exam. And your patient has a pulmonary embolism, what would you expect their, you know, acid base balance? What do you expect their gases to look like? Well, anybody who has any type of respiratory problems as their oxygen goes down, what's the compensation for a low oxygen? Increased respiratory rate. We want to get more oxygen in our body, right? And they can tend to hyperventilate, excuse me, hyperventilate. So very early signs of respiratory failure. Um, we see an increased respiratory rate and we see a respiratory alkalosis. But then sometimes people with pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, whatever, they start getting tired of, of that high respiratory, you know, that, that high respiratory rate. But, but that's really going to be the first thing that happens when, when somebody has a per pulmonary embolism is a perfect example. They get short of breath and they start hyperventilating. And, and there, anybody, whatever the cause is, it causes somebody to hyperventilate. And that hyperventilation is going to put them into a respiratory alkalosis. Mixed acid base, you do not need to memorize this. This is just something I wanted to show you. Two primary disorders that occur at the same time. Somebody, this is a simple acid base disturbance. We just talked about it metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, and then the other one would be respiratory acidosis, which was probably up here and I got cut off. Most common in hospital patients and patients in the ICU, they might have a mixed acid base. They might have a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory al al alkalosis. Okay, Somebody might be hyperventilating or they may be put on the ventilator and we're breathing them too fast and we're blowing off too much of their CO2, but they're in renal failure, so they're in a metabolic acidosis, right? Or or they have they have they have diarrhea and they're in a metabolic acidosis. Somebody's NG tube is hooked up to, to suction and and they're getting all anxious and, and, and panicky and they're in a met metabolic alkalosis and a respiratory alkalosis. So that's all you need to know when when just know what mixed acid base means when somebody's referred to it. There's there's mixed, there's more than one problem going on. So let's just take one slide to talk about compensation. I've talked a little bit about it throughout, but it's important that you understand this concept. Respiratory disorder. Okay, I thought I thought I typed this wrong for a second, but now I'm looking at it. Okay, respiratory disorders. Somebody has a respiratory disorder. Okay, so let's say somebody has respiratory acidosis, meaning their CO2 is increasing, okay? A respiratory acidosis, something is causing them to retain CO2, hypoventilation, something is causing hypoventilation, which is causing hypercapnia. How does the body compensate? Kidneys compensate for respiratory disorders. Lungs compensate for metabolic disorders. How does the kidney compensate for respiratory acidosis. Well, think about it. There's too much acid in the blood, so how can the kidneys help? The kidneys can help by holding on, whoops, this should be, I don't know, by, the kidneys can help by holding on to bicarb, holding on to a base. If we hold on to a base when somebody's acidotic, that's going to even the pH. Remember that calculation, that confusing calculation I showed you at first? What about if somebody's in a respiratory alkalosis? What causes a respiratory alkalosis? Anything that causes hyperventilation and CO2 is going to be excreted. How do the kidneys eventually compensate for a respiratory alkalosis? They're already in an alkal uh, alkalosis. The kidneys are going to excrete or get rid of bicarb. That's how compensation occurs. Now, a respiratory acidosis is acute, acute or chronic, and, and so we see compensation in a respiratory acidosis. Often respiratory alkalosis is more just acute, and it's usually taken care of before the pain is taken care of, the, 
fever is taken care of, the panic attack is taken care of before really there's any compensation. But just understand the concept that if somebody is in a chronic respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys compensate by getting rid of base, getting rid of bicarb, so then this pH can normalize. Metabolic disorder, or metabolic acidosis, there's a problem anywhere in the body except the lungs. That's a metabolic disorder. So we talked about causes of metabolic acidosis. How do we compensate? The lungs compensate. We have a metabolic acidosis, meaning the bicarb is low. That's a metabolic acidosis. And if we're in a metabolic acidosis, how do the lungs compensate for a metabolic acidosis? Blows off, decreases CO2, meaning respiratory rate increases. A metabolic alkalosis, we have an increase in bicarb. How does the body compensate for a metabolic alkalosis? The lungs compensate. We have an alkalosis. How can the lungs help with an alkalosis? By holding on to CO2. How do we hold on to CO2? Respiratory rate decreases. So these are important to know. Understand the basic compensatory mechanisms. Lung for the body, metabolic disorders, kidneys compensate for the lungs. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you and good night.